Hi, my name is Mutu Singaram. I'm going to talk to you in the next 45 minutes about incubation and pre-incubation management. Before I get started, I want you to spend one minute to think about what would you like to have accomplished in terms of learning at the end of 45 minutes. So please take a minute and I'm going to pause for a minute to let you write that down. You don't have to share it with me or anyone else, but just with yourself. Go for it. One minute. Okay, let's continue. The first topic we're going to talk about is how you'd plan your incubator. When you plan an incubator, you need to first of all understand who your community you're building it for, what it is a long-term investment. It's not a short-term investment. So before you establish an incubator, you need to look at who your community is and who are the stakeholders. Once you've done that, you need to move on to the next stage where you have to effectively plan what are the key factors you need to look at to ensure that you're going to have a successful in initiative and how you're going to get your returns for your principal stakeholder. In this case, would be the host institution. Once you have done that, you got to work through three things. The first thing you need to do is to do a feasibility study. Once you've done the feasibility study, you need to do next the incubator business plan and third you need to have policies for your incubator now let's take a look at each one of these one at a time the first component of the three components we are speaking about the first one is about feasibility study why do we need to do a feasibility studies as you know there's a lot of colleges there's a lot of establishments oh, creating incubators because it is fashionable right now to have incubators. However, saying that we need to ensure that the incubator we set up is going to be productive. It's going to help your institution, your students, your faculty, your community. This is why you need to do a pre-feasibility study, putting together the right team to plan the incubator. Once you have done that, when you have a team, the team will need to now look at what the market needs. Not every college needs the same thing. Not every district needs the same thing. Not every student or faculty needs the same thing. So you got to do an analysis of your stakeholders. Once you've done an analysis of stakeholders, you will be able to assess what you need to do for your incubator. So primarily you need to have a proper solution for your incubator. Once you have done that, you need to now build a business plan, just like any other business. Your incubator needs to have a business plan. Without a business plan, you will not be able to sustain on a long term. So you need to have a mission statement, you have to have a vision statement, and you need to work out what are the strategies you're going to use to build your incubator and you then need to design a sustainable business model. How will you generate income to make things happen for your incubator? You do need income, you do need money to run activities within your incubator. Next, you need to look at what is the overall infrastructure consideration? What are you going to build? What are you going to do? What equipments are you going to buy? How are you going to set it up? Where are you going to set it up? What are the staff you need? So this is the next important consideration. Once you've got your business plan together, you need to have incubator policies. The first one is 
how do you admit people into your incubator so this is called the entrance and selection criteria once you have done this you need to get in a incubator contract you need to have a contract between you and the incubator what is the conditions what will they do and what will you do so these are pretty important documents you may need to get uh, expert accountants secretary company secretaries and lawyers to help you set this up once you have done that you also need to have things like exit policies let's say the incubator is not doing a good job how do you get rid of them you can't have bad stock because that would actually bring you down so you need to work out how you would exit bad ones how would you graduate the good ones what happens after graduation would you be giving them any more services now that they're no longer your incubators so are you going to continue to help them so like having an edubinary how will they all get together how will they help each other how would they contribute to the incubator finally you need to have an overall incubator governance and management how will you manage and govern your incubator who are the people going to advise you who are the people going to run the incubator what all do you need to follow so these are very very important things you need to set up the initial task for your development team first you need to reach a consensus on the basic concept the objectives of the incubator what would you like to do at the incubator and what would you like to achieve over the next three, five, ten years. Very important, first thing. Next, you need to set up a time frame and tasks to carry out your preliminary work before creating an incubator. How long will you take to do a feasibility study? Once you have done your feasibility study, how long will you take to do your next business planning? And finally, actually getting the policies in place and setting up your incubator. You, during this time, you need to also learn more about business incubation as a concept and in application. So you may want to spend some time visiting other incubators nearby you, if there are good incubators. If not, find out where the incubators are, the nearest one, who have been running for some time. Call them up, make an appointment to see whether you can work, work with them, to learn from them. So that's the next thing you do. Once you have done, you need to secure some resources for your feasibility studies. You will need some money, to do some study, travel, to write your business, sorry, your feasibility study. And then you need to implement your feasibility study. This is where you need to make decisions on the results and planning for your next phase of development. So these are some of the things you need to do before you can set up your incubator. And you need to build learning capability within your team. First of all, you might attend some online training resources just to see how other incubators have done. You might want to do an incubator study tour, like I've just now said. You might choose four, five, six incubators to visit to see what they are doing, how you can adopt some of their practices. I would like to caution you at this stage, you cannot replicate other incubators because each incubator has its own issues, its own success factors, its own strengths, its own weaknesses. So you can only learn and adopt. You cannot replicate because, for example, if you take the major cities, they have access to a lot of resources, including investors, government agencies, and other institutions. If you're far away outside the city, you may not have this access. So you need to ensure your particular incubator is able to adjust to all those surroundings and build your incubator accordingly. Next thing, you need to get into incubator networks so you're able to understand what other incubators are doing, attend their events, learn from them. Sometimes you might want to do a joint activity with another incubator so that keeps resources lower and also gives you a better, a, a better reach. And you need to also keep in touch with the emerging technologies and emerging activities in this area so you are sure that you will be able to do what you have to do to ensure the learning and building capacity of incubators is always there. It's, it's, it should be your objective to always and constantly be learning just like anything else. 
incubation is all about learning and improving so it's very very important now let's look at infrastructure of course the most important factor for an incubator is to have infrastructure and facility and you and i know setting up an infrastructure and facility costs money and most likely the host institution will be reluctant initially to spend this money because they need to know what will be the outcome of this so you who has taken the task to set up the incubator will need to emphasize emphasize to the management that the incubator is a investment it's not a cost center it will help build student skills it will help build faculty skills it will give your institution a branding that you are able to create employment instead of looking for employment so if you had every year 10 startups giving five jobs you have reduced 50 you have reduced 50 students going in for your um, placement so you've now placed 50 students within your own startup ecosystem so this is why a startup ecosystem is so important because they can create wealth locally it's an economic stimulus so it's important to emphasize all this and then get infrastructure set up initially you don't need too much infrastructure you could use existing infrastructure you can even identify a space within the the host institution not being used and you can convert that or you can double piggyback with your existing lab where you can start running some activities out of it as you create momentum then you can go back to management and say look in the last six months to 12 months we have created 20 projects so now we need our own space we need our own identity so please give us some space you can still continue to use the equipment in the in the laboratories because they are already paid for so that's how you would get your thing started next you need to identify the resources you need like salaries because the incubator should be run independently by a full-time manager or an executive who will manage the day-to-day -day activity because faculty will not have time to be able to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis so it's important to hire a team of people who can run your incubator once you have identified your funds you need to know which locations and sectors you're going to focus so that could be based on what your institution is good at if you're good at biotechnology you may want to get into a biotechnology incubator your if your college is good at engineering you might want to do that if your college is good at it you might want to do that however many of you might not be able to do that you might have to start with a general incubator and then build skills as you go along once you have done this you are ready to get into building the incubator all this requires resources funds and then you start to build you need flexible configuration in the location so that is good for business for clients free and and debt minimized so you need to ensure the building needs to be suitable and flexible for the clients to be using it and following it through you need to have feasible financial plans both short and long term how would you run the incubator in short term and long term generally in short term you'd probably get good support from host institution but in the long run you need to look at how you will get extra from outside which we will discuss in this presentation now that you're ready that you've done your feasible study you've done your business plan and you've also done your policies you will now look at how you would design your incubator and you need to spend a good lot of time because the design will depend on the objective and the area you have decided to get into based on that you will then design some space now this is one of the incubators i have designed and it runs extremely well so you can see how different this incubator looks the design of this incubator is being made to suit the startups what they need so you need to leverage it's so so important that design you create in the incubator is with a purpose it has to it has to actually make people want to come to the incubator so it is worth your while spending time and a little bit of money to make sure people want to come and work if you look at this design which we are showing it's very attractive it says come work with me come to my place you need collaboration collaborating space creative and idea generating areas where people can sit work together create new ideas 
because what is startup is all about creating new stuff new ideas but however teams would like to have some space where they can talk discuss build their products together as a team so you need to be working with them to help them with this space a lot of effort has to be put in it doesn't really matter if it takes you a long time because the end objective is to ensure that you are able to give a good working environment so your startups can think freely they have with less restriction sometimes it helps if it's a distance away from the classrooms so it's a different type of setup now let's look at the three important words we keep talking about pre-incubation incubation and acceleration it is a good idea for you to run a pre-incubation program maybe three to six months to ensure the startups you bring in doesn't matter it's faculty students from outside that they are the right people you're bringing into your incubator because you're going to spend lots of money time and effort you want to make sure that this is spent well so that's the idea of doing a pre-incubation period three to six months where to validate their idea whether it can go to market once they're ready to start building the product and taking it to market you start incubating them and this is why you will get better teams if you're on a pre-incubation model then you become when you incubate you get better teams so this is the next thing incubation can last anything between three to five years depending on what area you choose so the area of life sciences pharma could take five even seven years so you need to be careful what you're choosing you will choose the area as i said earlier on the expertise you have of your faculty and your student and actually a community around you because you need your community to support you so that's when you will run your incubation program the generally accelerated programs are run by industry or or people who have or entrepreneurs who've been successful so that program usually lasts between 12 to 6 months some even a year primarily that acceleration program is to take your company to the next level so this is would be actually expanding into the market and this is when the company will start to generate income and hopefully when they generate income it will benefit your incubator not only financially but in terms of reputation so this is what you need to think through how you're going to make sure that happens now how do you set up your incubator there are several ways you can set up your incubator the first one is called a society second one is a section 8 the third one is a trust depending on your host institution depending on you you will decide which ones you would want to go into if you're going to take equity in your startups section 8 is a little easier to sort out society and trust is a little more difficult and complex so you need to think through which one you want to but all three structures are generally for no profit it's non-profit organizations so you doesn't mean you don't make money whatever money you make you plow it back into the system to make it better and better and better so you would use the money you generate to run the incubator better so these are the three options you have now my advice to you would be to talk to your host institution what would they like to do and it's always better to run this as a separate entity which means it has got its own management structure it has got its own staff so it knows it has to do to survive so that's why it's important and it's easier to raise money from outside if you have an independent setup so this is something you need to think about which one you want to do once your institution has decided which one you want to do however before deciding you should probably call your accountant and your lawyer and find out with your current situation what is the best way to run your incubator once you've got that those advice you can you're ready to set up now how will you fund the incubator initially there is no way you can get money from outside because people don't know what you're doing they really don't know whether you're going to be successful whether you're going to do anything useful so therefore it is important for you to be able to convince management the host institution to give you some initial funding to run this uh, project or incubator once you have done that for maybe six months a year there are several government fundings you can reach out i have listed some of them nstedb italian innovation mission is aims BIREC comes under the department of 
Biotech, MITI comes under the Department Ministry of Electronics, MSME, NRDC, and DST. All of them do give funding grants to incubators, but these are on limited periods. They will not fund you forever because they want you to become sustainable so they can go on and help other incubators, newer incubators. So that's the objective. It should be able to sustain. You can raise money today through CSR funding. So you need to make sure you get connected well with your community in within your within your area who will be willing to give you some funding through their CSR activity to build the ecosystem, to fund your incubator, to survive. And most importantly, you need to start building the alumni network. This is one of the things the Western universities have done very well. Indian universities haven't done this very well, but the IITs and IIMs have done fairly well. Bring in your alumni because alumni can help fund and many of your alumni would be successful. So they can even take these startups to, to market, to help them, to support them and so on. So alumni is very, very important. If you don't have an alumni association, that's one of the things the incubator should start doing, create an alumni association. Second important part here is to get as many industry to come to your incubator, work with your startup, for your incubators to work with them, help. So going to market makes it easier because these industries already have a network which they can help you penetrate. How do you handle the finances at the incubator? Very important question. If you don't have money, you can't do many things. Right? You will only get money if you do the right things and if you do it the right way. So the first thing you need to need money is to establish your incubator. We already talked about you need to convince the host institution to give you some money to start the incubator. If you're not able to raise the money, you should at least convince them to give you some space, give you some laboratory, some equipment. So you get your incubator initially started and then you need to run activities. Here you can reach out to your students, entrepreneurship club, engineering club, you know, radio club those days was to be popular. So you need to set up activities, things like this to encourage your students to come participate. And you should also reach out to the local community so they can also fund some activities. You don't need much activities. Many local banks do lunch and learn sessions. They'll be happy to come and do lunch and learn sessions where you give them five minutes slot. You can invite a good speaker, come speak, give them lunch, simple lunch, pizzas, or, or even samosa and tea. So you need to run regular, regular programs to make sure there's enough, there's enough activities within the incubator. You need to make sure your operations are efficient and that whatever money you spend, there's outcome. You need, you don't need too many staff. You need maybe two, three people in an incubator to get it going. You need to make sure at all time, your team is looking at the overall goal and your ultimate goal for all of you should be to be able to sustain by yourself. If you're able to sustain by yourself, you don't need to go back to management and say, give me some money. And when you don't ask for money, nobody troubles you because they're not giving money. So they don't really worry about you. They'll stay out of your way. So it's important for an incubation manager, incubation team to look for ways to, to find ways to generate income or to raise money. So very, very important. Now, what are the other expenses you will end up with? There's already pre-operational expenses like we talked about earlier. You need to go visit, you need to travel, you need to do some market research, survey, research, whatever you have to do to make sure you get your feasibility report in place. You need money. So there is a pre-operating expense you need to take care of. Once you've passed that, you need to now work on physical facilities. Some places you have to pay rental, some places the host institution will not charge you anything. Their contribution would be to give you space. Next thing you need to look for equipment. So here you need to raise money to buy the equipment. The host institution might give you some equipment. Local industry might also donate equipment. So you need to get a good relationship. Next, you need money for your human resources. These are the people who are running your incubator, who are working in the incubator, extremely important. Then of course, just like any other business, you'll end up having general expenses. This could be things like the regular coffee, tea, maintenance, so on. So these are general expenses you need to take into account. And finally, you need to have some reserves because if you're not able to raise money, you cannot run your incubator. So you should always try to see an horizon of three years, at least how you'll run your incubator for 
Now, how would you generate income? These are some of the ways you can generate income. The first one is actually you can rent your space to incubate this. The incubator can actually do consulting services and then the incubator can have royalty agreements with the incubators. So these are some of the examples how you would generate income. And then third party generation of income would be through government grants. But these are usually one off. You will not continue to get. So you need to ensure that you are always ahead for funding. Very, very important. The moment there is no funds, your incubator will not be able to survive. So very, very, very important. There are some international bodies like the World Bank. They provide grants, specifically if you run programs, maybe gender programs, poverty programs and so on. There are people who give funding for those programs. And of course, next thing is corporate funding. They will give you some sponsors and so on. So this is how you would generate your income. So please work through that. Now, let's take a look at the comparison. There are two types of incubators, obviously. One is a for-profit incubator and the other is a non-profit incubator. Obviously, if you're not a non-profit, it's probably easier to get money from private grants. From If you're for profit, you need to look for private investment. Corporate responsibility will work for both. Government subsidies are generally given to non-profits and you can run multi, multilateral programs to, see, to generate income, both sides. And non-government organization funding mechanisms are there for non-profit. For profit, it would be harder. Debt funding, obviously, if you're a profit, you can pay back your debts. If you're a non-profit incubator, it might be difficult, so you may not want to do that. You could also have in-kind services, like your mentors, your trainers. They might say, okay, we will give you services in terms of maybe in the future you will give us some equity in some startups when they do mentoring so all this you need to think through carefully before getting to the next stage now what does the incubator need it needs an incubator manager first of all very important when we call them a manager it could be an executive just running it that's fine it's very important to have someone who's responsible a faculty in charge can be the interface between the incubator and the host institution. So that's the role the incub that's the role the faculty in charge be doing. It should be bridging the incubator to the host uh, host institution. You probably need to have somebody who will run training programs for your incubators. You need to probably have a person who's technically capable to a certain extent to help them. You need someone who can do management of your finances this can be probably you can probably reach out to the host institution to help you with that existing system so far um, not to my knowledge there is no incubator who's doing a residential program so that could be another opportunity some incubators may want to look at having accommodation if you do that then you need to have a service manager who will take care of all this accommodation logistics and so on right now to my knowledge there isn't one incubator in India which is residential. So, I mean, there could be an opportunity for a residential program, just like a residential MBA. So you may want to think about that. Now, these are some of the key skill sets you require. You don't have to have an individual to do all of these. Administration, for example, financial, legal, HR, IT, all this can be outsourced. You pay when you need. The facility management and ICT infrastructure, you can rely on your host institution to help you with all this because they already have facility management they already have it structure which you can use you can piggyback on it you need to ensure that the quality of business development service you provide to your clients meaning your startups it has to be good so you got to have a good set of people who know how to do business development they can be from outside you can hire them when you need you need to have quality office infrastructure service which you already spoke about you need to be able to teach them or guide them at least to, to go marketing. Because no point having a great product if it cannot be marketed. So it's very, very important for you to do that. And then you need to have someone who knows how to stake whole management. These are key staff skills. I'm not saying you need to have one person for everything. Your staff should be able to plan, should be able to report, should be able to monitor and evaluate. So your incubator manager should be able to do many of these things with the support of, it, of his team. 
what should the incubator provide? Obviously, the easiest and probably not the most important is to give them the physical infrastructure. As you know today, places like Bangalore, Chennai, Delhi, Hyderabad, Mumbai, they have hundreds and hundreds of these workspaces where people can hire them. They are all very beautifully done up, trendy, nice places for a seat, anything between 2000 rupees to 10,000 rupees. So physical infrastructure is not the most important. Next thing, very, very important for any incubator and most incubators are lacking is to having mentors who can technically help and give business support. You need both types of mentors to guide your startups. And another thing which is missing in many startups is they don't get good legal support in terms of IP management, intellectual property. They don't know what to patent. They don't know what to copyright. So you need to make sure you have this support in place so your startups know what to do with their product, whether is it to patent, is it to do copyright, is it to do design, whatever. You need someone who can help them to do this. And many startups are unaware of regulatory framework, especially if you do life sciences, biomedical, you need to ensure that you're following the rules regulatory. Many, another thing which startups are lacking is market research. Before they start, they don't do market research. So your incubator has to support them in terms of market research and also types of business services you provide. Some of them may need help in terms of HR. You don't have to provide them, but you need to guide them. You need to also guide them how to manage finances, right? So if they don't have any finances, they're not going to be able to continue. So these are some of the things it's very, very important for you to ensure that you are helping them. You also need to make sure there's enough industry connect because without industry connect markets cannot, products cannot get to market. So it's very, very important. You need to have a set of uh, access to funding in terms of government funding, corporate funding, venture capital, angels, and so on. You need to have a set of that. You need to be able to guide them how they can skill, so how they can go out and scale. So this is something you need to be all in place. You need to also provide good networking facilities for them to get to know each other. Now we're going to talk about one of the most important things that incubators should do is have a effective if you like, the important word here is effective mentoring program and what are the success factors. So this is something you'd want to do. Now, there are different, different roles. So let me just take you through these roles. Counseling is primarily given, you probably do to student counseling, to students who are not doing great. That's not what we're looking at here. This is usually to improve. And then manager usually gives tasks and he gets sure that people are getting it done. Coaching is primarily to inspire and motivate people, just like a football coach or a cricket coach. It's done in a group, not one-to-one. -one. Mentoring is primarily for giving instructions and guiding. They don't manage you. They don't do things for you. They primarily share with you. So let's go next. Now, what do entrepreneurs need? Entrepreneurs need mentoring. They need guidance. They need support. They don't need coaching most of the time, which if they do, they can always reach out to that. They don't need to be managed because the whole idea of them becoming a startup, they don't want to be managed. So that's something they are not looking for. Hopefully we don't need to counsel them, but sometimes we might have to. As you can see, a coach, coaching, coach, coachy, mentor, mentee, manager, managee, counselor, counselee. So these are the way these roles are. Sometimes you in the incubator have to play all these roles. You need to balance the roles. You don't always do counseling. You don't always do coaching. Depending on what it requires, you should be able to adjust accordingly. Now, I'm going to focus on mentoring because I think that's what most incubators need to focus on primarily how to do mentoring. This is a Latin word. Mentoring means endure. Primarily what a coach a mentor does is he shares his, his vast, unique, complex experience to the startup in a way the startup can understand. But however, the mentor can at times do coaching or training if it's required. He can give training related work to the startup. Mentoring is primarily offering service to support as a person and may touch on any aspect of their life. A coach is specifically and tightly focused. So they would do certain activities which are of 
important. <coughs> now we're going to talk about the elements of mentoring. The first thing is of course to recruit your mentor. You need to screen them because today this is like a very fancy word. Everybody wants to be a mentor. So you got to make sure the person who comes in as a mentor is going to create value. So this is how you screen. Next, you might do some training. Then you match the mentee and mentee. And then you will follow through the mentoring and mentoring support. And then of course you have to close. Now mentoring will change over time. Somebody initially might need product mentoring. As they grow, they might want business mentoring. And after that, they might want some research mentoring. It, it depends. So mentoring will keep on changing depending on which stage of the startup chain you are. So you'd always be, you, you can outgrow your mentor. And so the mentor also must be ready to, to move on just like the mentee. There are two types of mentoring. One is natural, which is given to you by your friends, coaches, teachers. You all probably do that already. And counseling. Plan is pretty much done on a structured program where the mentors and mentees are matched. So this is what we're going to look at. Now, why are mentoring programs becoming popular? We've been doing this for years in the Gurukul system in India, where a senior student would teach a junior student because there was only one teacher. So the teacher would, would focus on the higher standards and the students among themselves will teach each other. So it's just piggybacking with somebody who just got experience. So a third, third grader would follow a fourth grader and a fourth grader would follow a fifth grader. Fifth grader will follow a sixth grader and the teacher would probably be guiding the sixth grader. So this is how the system already has been there in existence. You need mentoring because it increases survival rate of your entrepreneurs because you're able now to learn from experienced entrepreneurs. So that's very, very important. Experienced entrepreneurs also help you build your skills quickly, accelerate learning, and you get confident when a successful, uh, men, successful mentor is mentoring you. It builds confidence. It's also a great sounding board. It helps you find out what is good and what is not so good in your own organization and improve. So this is why mentoring programs are becoming more and more popular. Next, how does mentoring work? First thing. People are matched informally or formally via interviews and personal profile, common interests or networking events. Mentors are usually from a varied background. Mentors are usually sought informally or formally. This depends on what you actually require. Based on your requirement, you need to be able to decide where you will find the mentor and what is the purpose of the mentor. Now, as I explained to you, why mentoring program is needed. There are two types of mentor. One can be an expert and one can be a role model. Role model, for example, you might have never seen that person in your life before, but you still get mentored by them. For example, many people would have followed our late and president, Kalam, where a lot of students might take inspiration from his life story. So that's the kind of a role model mentoring you have. Then you would have expert mentoring, people who know a specific area which you are not so sure. It's all about helping and learning and knowledge. It's all about help, new skills, new knowledge, helping you do that. You increase by doing this your success rate because you're getting new skills, so you're able to uplift your success rate. Again, as I explained, your self-esteem and confidence are also built. And please remember, mentoring is never one to many. One to many is generally a coaching activity. Here it's usually one to one. Now, what are mentoring programs used for? Of course, I already talked about education in academics. They put a piggyback system. They call it a buddy system. And of course, career, there are sometimes a senior manager would mentor a junior to get them through the thing. You would also have personal development. The CEOs of the Fortune 500, they have mentors who help them build their personal development. Even the most successful people in the world, they, have, they are hire mentors and, and also many of them have coaches, personal coaches, to guide them through problems which they would like to discuss with them. Here we are talking about venture mentoring. Venture mentoring is for startups. Now, there are several types of mentoring. One is called open or closed. What does open mean? Open means it is you are allowed to talk about anything 
with a mentor. Closed, you can only speak about specific things. So for example, in your incubator, it might only be work related, then it's a closed. Or open, you can talk about personal activities as well to the mentor. So this is other two types, open, closed. Next one is called private and public. Private, nobody knows except the mentor and mentee. Public, everybody knows I'm your mentor, you're my mentee, or you're my mentor, I'm your mentee. So everybody knows. That's called a public relationship. Uh, most often these are probably private and the last one is whether you have a formal agreement that means you have a return document what would come out of this says what would come out of the relationship now when you do formal it's generally good to have some financial engagement in it so both sides take it seriously informal could be just you know you like me i like you and i start mentoring you with no no formal agreement a formal agreement would actually set out what each one of us will have to do. So these are some of the things you may want to look at. Now, how does a mentor help you? First of all, he helps you understand social behavior because he's got experience. So it is important for him to help you understand social behavior. Next, he will help you or she will help you to learn how an organization works because some of our startups may not have not worked anywhere. So they would be able to teach you how an organization work. They would also promote learning. They would guide you how to learn. They will explore different and conflicting ideas. And then also we will look at office politics. So all this a mentor will be able to help. Now, an approach, a mentor's approach. First thing, the mentor should look at the company as a whole and not just the tech, technopreneur's need. Meaning you should not just look at the founder, but you need to look at what the entire organization needs and make sure the mentoring is done accordingly. It's often because for the entrepreneur, it is so important, his life depends on his startup. So for a mentor to ensure that it's successful, the mentor should look at it as a holistic way. Now, what is the first approach? Mentor must learn the business in terms of operation finance and marketing before coming in so at least the mentor will be able to understand what the mentee is doing mentor should have good assessment of the mentee's relationship with his company how the mentee is getting along with the other staff or the other co-founders or whoever the customers he needs to understand all that mentor should know about the relationships the startup has with investors and other business associates the stakeholders now, mentor's approach should be only people with complex experience in wide areas. It should not be too specific. It should be having a wide area because the role here is to guide and share. The next question is always whether the technopreneur will be able to lead the company to the next stage. Often you will see major companies change their CEOs as they move along because newer people need to be brought in to take them to the next level. So that, that as well, a mentor will have to guide the mentee. Mentors must ex identify external forces like culture, goal, and business in their processes. What will happen to their process? So all this is very, very important. Now, how does it do? Now I'm going to finish up with networking. Networking is the most important activity to your center incubator. You need to be able to conduct events. So you need to start with hackathons, workshops, seminars, expert talks, whatever attracts people into the system, bringing in startups, let them share, have a samosa and tea, have a pizza and, and learn all sorts of things you should do. You need to have reach out programs with renowned institutions and organizations, bring expert talk, talkers from there, speakers from there. You need to decide logistics, partnerships and how you would pay, what would you do? All this networking needs to be done. Then you need to form partnerships with investors, industry experts, other institutions, local government, because all these are major players to your incubator. So occasionally you might have an investors event, an industry expert talk, a local government authority comes and speaks about what they are looking for, what they can do for startups. So it's important to build all this relationship. You need to identify resource person to coordinate and follow up these partnerships. So these are important things. You need to be able to connect with technical officers, business and legal, marketing, advertising. They all should be able to connect. And this is your networking, extremely important, extremely, extremely important. And many of the incubators 
do not have good networks. So it's very important to do this. And the incubator manager should be willing to travel, visit, attend conferences, attend seminars, attend events, so he can build up the network, which he can bring back into his incubator. Now, what I'd like you to do next, I want you to identify your key takeaway from my lecture, write down just one point. What is your key takeaway from my lecture and how does it relate it to you and how you're going to share with others from this lecture? These are the three things I like you to take away from here. And you don't have to tell me, you don't have to tell anybody. You just need to tell yourself. Very important. Just tell yourself these three things. And that concludes my presentation. You can contact me by my email, mutu.singram at vibezone.com. My mobile number, 9197-9032420. You can pick up my books at Amazon. If you key in Mutu Singaram, you'll get two of my books. The e-copies are been produced in India, so you'll be able to pick that up. The hard copies come to the US, so they, may, they are a little bit more expensive. Now, I'm extremely passionate about innovation, entrepreneurship, incubation, acceleration, startups, and I've been doing it for the last 25 years. I'd be happy to come to your institution, talk to you, talk to your management, talk to your students, help you build the ecosystem. You can reach out to me at any time. I respond to all my SMSs, my emails, WhatsApp messages, my telephone calls. So once again, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I look forward to meeting you all soon.